Good morning, everyone, and welcome on this Epiphany Sunday to our virtual worship experience for both Friendly United Methodist Church and Sistersville First United Methodist Church. We welcome everybody to our worship this morning, whether you are a member, uh, a guest, a first-time visitor with us, somebody who's been away for a while and has come back, uh, or if you're just looking for a new church home where you attend another church and you're getting able, you're able to watch several different worship videos. Uh, on Sunday mornings or throughout the week, we welcome you to our worship experience here on this Epiphany Sunday. Uh, I'm going to change things up a little bit. I'm going to do the announcements actually in the beginning of our service uh, this month instead of at the end. So just kind of let you know some ministry opportunities that we have uh, in both churches. Uh, tonight um, at 7 o'clock, uh, our community youth group will meet uh, via Zoom. Uh, online. If you uh, have a child that is uh, grade six uh, and up and are interested in our youth program, please let us know on the comment section of this particular video. Uh, and we need to get an email address to you so we can send that Zoom link to you. And you're welcome to join. Parents are welcome to join us uh, as well. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we will be having a finance meeting for the Sistersville Church. Uh, the time is to be determined, but the finance team will, uh, will get that info as soon as possible. Uh, our ministerial association here in the Sistersville Friendly area has been doing uh, prayer walks every Monday night around uh, the town here of Sistersville, uh, starting at 6 o'clock, meeting at the Baptist Church parking lot. Uh, everybody is welcome to come out and be a part of that. Please bring your own candle or a light. Uh, one of those old battery-operated ones are probably better, uh, or if you want to just carry a little flashlight or something like that, that's fine as, as well. Uh, weather permitting, we'll meet at 6, we'll walk around town. Uh, it is a prayer walk for what is going on in this pandemic and in our area. Uh, masks are required and social distancing uh, is required. Uh, so, And you can bring your families, you can, whatever, just kind of stick together as a... Uh, your quarantine unit, and we will walk around town. Anybody is welcome. There's no charge uh, for that. 
Uh, Wednesday, January 6th, the Tabitha's Closet Ministry, Clothing Ministry up here at Sistersville will be open uh, from 1 to 3 p.m. Masks are required uh, to come in. So if you are in need of clothing, uh, please come and check us out. We are in the White Chapel uh, building, uh, right behind the city building here in Sistersville, across from the church uh, picnic shelter. Uh, there is a sign, vinyl sign out front. Uh, please uh, check us out. Again, that's 1 to 3. Uh, January 6th is the actual day of Epiphany, so I encourage you and invite you to read the uh, gospel story in Matthew chapter 2, uh, starting with uh, the first verse, talking about the uh, visit, of, well, of course, you'll hear about the birth of Christ, but also the visit uh, of the Magi, of the wise men, which is what we celebrate on Epiphany, and we will celebrate uh, today as well. So do that at home uh, or check things out uh, online or anything that you can to kind of celebrate the day. Uh, next Sunday will be the baptism of our Lord uh, Sunday, so we'll no longer have the Advent and Christmas decorations that you see uh, here before you. Uh, we'll be back to looking uh, a little bit more regular routinely, but also we'll have the baptismal font available and we'll show you a little bit what we're going to do with that uh, beginning uh, of the service next week. Just a reminder that we have several upcoming ministries and things that are going on. Uh, at Sistersville, we are hoping to start a handbell choir. Uh, if you are interested in playing handbells or would like to donate to the handbells, please let us know. Uh, if you'd like to donate, just make checks payable to Sistersville First UMC. And then uh, line, and in your memo line, just put handbells. Uh, it's going to cost around right a little over $7,000 to purchase the bells and everything that we need so we can get started uh, with that. But if you're interested in playing at all, let us know. We'll make sure we get you signed up, and we'll let you know when we have the money and know what the bells are worth so we can really start to practice. Uh, we are also doing a Boxes of Joy ministry here at Sistersville, uh, but this is really open to anybody in the community. Uh, if you have a college student or anybody that is part of the armed services that is serving overseas or away from home that you would like us to send uh, a couple times a year a goodie box uh, from the church, letting them know we th we're thinking about them, plus they can have some treats and just be kind of caught up on what's happening in the life of Sistersville and Friendly in the surrounding area and in the churches. We need those names as soon as possible. We're hoping to get one of those boxes sent out uh, by around Valentine's Day uh, of this year, so please... Let us know that information. Uh, also, if you are a member of Sistersville and are on the mailing list, you would have received a, a little pledge card, uh, a little piece of paper uh, in the Advent packets we sent out a few weeks ago. Uh, we invite you and encourage you to prayerfully consider making a pledge uh, for how much you would like to tithe or give to the church uh, in 2021. Uh, if you would like to do that, uh, please get those back to us as soon as possible so we can uh, be prepared for financial decisions, budget decisions going forward uh, for next year. Uh, and this was a, a helpful reminder for you uh, as well. Uh, so if you'd like, and the importance of tithing. So if you'd like to make a pledge, please get that to us at the, in the church office or mail it back in, uh, P.O. Box 185, Sistersville, West Virginia, 26175. Uh, also, just a reminder, if you are interested in the Sacrament of Holy Communion, I can serve you all individually or maybe even as a family unit uh, at, a, at a neutral site. So please let us know. Call me. Contact me. Contact the church office. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure we can arrange that uh, by appointment uh, only. Uh, also, the just a reminder, the upper rooms are in. Uh, at both churches, so for January and February, if you're interested or you usually get an upper room and would like one, let us know or stop by the church when the church is open uh, for office hours, and we'll get that to you uh, as well. The Tabitha's Closet it is, again, open from 1 to 3 on the first Wednesday of the month during the winter, and also on the third Saturday from 10 to noon. Uh, we are only taking donations of kids or children's clothing uh, at this time. So if you have any donations, let us know, uh, and we'll make arrangements to get that from you or for you to drop that off, and we'll make that, make that work. Uh, our backpack ministry, uh, we are serving right now, at, I believe it's 137 children each week between the elementary school here in Sistersville and the middle school and high school. Uh, we've worked it out with the local schools and the bus drivers, even when the schools are virtual like they are right now. 
where they're able to deliver those for those particular kids when they're able to deliver the regular meals uh, each day. So we're still able to get those uh, out to our students. If you'd like to donate to that, the best thing you can do really right now is just donate financially. Just write Sistersville First UMC and put Backpack Ministry uh, in the memo line. Uh, the Friendly and I Methodist Church Food Pantry is still going strong with serving over 300 people uh, throughout this pandemic so far. Uh, we are in need of peanut butter and jelly, boxes of cereal, canned beans, and spaghetti and sauce because those go in every, to everybody's box when we give out food. Uh, if you would like to give to that, uh, if you're a member of Friendly and have access to get into the building, just place the things on the table in the food pantry. Uh, or if you do not, please call me. We'll make arrangements to get it. Or if you're a part of Sisterhood or would like to donate it here, Please bring it to the church office. We'll make sure it needs to get down to the Friendly Food Pantry. Uh, and lastly, uh, the Faith Hands Necessities Closet uh, is advertising items that they need each month. And fortunately, they're doing really well right now. But the two items that they need uh, for this upcoming month in January uh, are razors uh, and shampoo. Those are the items that they need. So if you'd like to donate to that, please contact the church office We'll make arrangements for you to drop those off or get those uh, from you. Uh, also, just a reminder, uh, we have uh, here at Sistersville, but again, this is open to both churches in the community. Uh, we are having, we have a prayer box outside of the church office entryway. Uh, it's a middle metal box on the bottom. It says prayer requests. There's a pad and a paper and a pen. You can fill out any prayer requests that you have. Fold it up and put it in the slot on the above. That is just the prayer request. Uh, I check that periodically throughout the week. Uh, so it's anonymous until I get it. Uh, so if you'd like to pray, you do not have to be a member of this church or either church. Uh, you're, anybody is welcome to come and pray at it. So that is there for your use. Uh, also to all students, parents, uh, and to the, and to the uh, educators out there, we have uh, set up uh, an extender on our Wi-Fi. Uh, out for outside and on the old marquee sign at Sistersville it has the password and the username uh, that you can hook up to so if you're having trouble downloading things at home or out at the school and would like to come and just hook up to the internet here uh, to download what you need to download please come and do that you don't even have to get out of your car to do it it should reach out into the street uh, so we um, that is open to you so please come check that out that'll be on the marquee until this pandemic is over, and we don't need that anymore, but uh, let, we'll let you know that is, uh, is an option. So those are the announcements uh, that we have and the ministry opportunities that we have this week. Let us begin our worship together with this gathering prayer. God of promise and light, open our eyes this morning that we may see your light in the darkness. Open our hearts that we may see your light in the darkness. Open our hearts that we may perceive your promises of justice and righteousness fulfilled in the babe of Bethlehem. May we, like the Magi, have a star to guide us on our journey, quest to find the, to find the one who will truly set us free. May this time of worship bring us closer to you that the good news of the birth of light and love will transform our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, we've got a couple hymns for you just uh, as we begin our worship uh, this morning. The first being Joy to the World and then We Three Kings. <laughs>
our children's message uh, this morning is uh, we're returning to Douglas again, and Douglas is going to share his take uh, on the wise men. So please check out to hear what Douglas has to say. We three kings of Oriental, pretty neat, let's talk about that. Hey guys, Merry Christmas. Yeah, hey, it's me, Douglas, and uh, well, today I'm going to talk to you guys about the wise men and the three gifts they brought to baby Jesus. So we talk about the wise men during Christmas time because in the Bible, especially you know in Matthew, it talks about these wise men who came in and gave gifts to baby Jesus after he was born. And you know we have the wise men on the nativity scenes that we have, you know the decorations that we have. And the Bible says that they brought three gifts. They brought gold and frankincense and more. And okay, gold, everybody knows what gold is. That makes sense. Gold, gold is, is gold. You know, it's like money. But frankincense and myrrh, I, you know, I had no idea what they were, so I wanted to look them up. And I tell you what, man, anytime I find something I'm curious about in the Bible and my, my parents or my grandparents help me research it, I always find the coolest stuff. Both frankincense and myrrh were like a, a really rare kind of tree sap. Yeah, so like sticky stuff that comes out of a tree and they smelled really good. And so frankincense they used in the temple. They, they would light it on fire or they'd get it really hot and it would start to smoke. And the smoke was incense. It was something that, that smelled really good and it was like a thing. It was kind of like a burnt offering to God was this incense. You know, they'd burn incense in the temple. We don't do that in a whole lot of Christian churches these days. But back when Jesus was walking around on earth, it was a thing that the Israelites, they would use to to honor God. They would they would light this incense and it would honor God. And myrrh is also, it was also a tree sap, but this stuff they would put in like lotions or like perfumes and make good smelling stuff. And, and a lot of times, most of the time, what they would use it for is they would use it for when someone died, they would use it to make it so that their body didn't smell bad after they died because when you die, your body kind of starts to get stinky. But they'd put this perfume stuff on it so it wouldn't smell so bad and you would you would be a little bit nicer when they buried you. And there's lots of theories about these three different gifts and why they were given. But my very favorite theory, my favorite favorite idea is, is uh, well, okay, so gold is something that you would give to a king. Really, all of these things are things you would give to a king. So no matter what the theory, we know that these guys knew that Jesus was the king, the uh, king of kings. And so they were bringing him gifts that you would bring to a king, not that you would bring to just any old kid who was born in a barn. And so my favorite theory is that gold is something you would give to a king, like tribute that you would give to a king. And incense is like something that, you know, you burn the incense, the frankincense, you, you, uh, that's like a gift to God. And the myrrh is a thing that you would use for someone who had died, someone who was like a mortal. So uh, a mortal, not immortal, someone, someone who can die. So those three gifts are kind of saying three things about Jesus. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and so they give him money. And Jesus is also God. Jesus and God are one. Jesus is God's son. And so they would give him this incense because that's something you would give to God. But Jesus was also human. He was also a person. He was also mortal. So Jesus could die. So they gave him something for when he died. So that's Je that's who Jesus is. Jesus is God and he is man. He was both at the same time. And in all of that, he was also the king. So those three gifts were kind of saying three different things about who Jesus is. And that's just a theory. You know, the Bible doesn't say exactly why they gave each of those gifts, but that's that's my favorite theory of, of why they gave the gifts. And, you know, the Bible is very specific. It says there were wise men who came from the east, and they, they brought three gifts, the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh. And uh, it says that they came to Bethlehem, where Jesus was living. But it doesn't actually say how many wise men there were. Some people think there were three wise men because there were three gifts. Some people think there were like 12 wise men. Some people, you know, they just say, we have no idea how many wise men there were. There are legends, okay, so not in the Bible, but stories that people have told through the Alti generations that there were just three wise men and that their names were Caspar, Melchior, and Bal Balthazar. And they believed that, that Caspar was from India and he was really old and, and Melchior was from Persia and he was kind of old. And then there was Balthazar who was from... Well, people kind of argue about where he was from. Some people say he was from Babylon. Some people say he was from Ethiopia. And, but, and he was kind of old. So like maybe 60, 40, and 20 
or how old they were. But again, this isn't in the Bible. The Bible says that there were, th there were three gifts and there were wise men, but it doesn't tell us how many wise men or exactly who they are. So we kind of just have to guess who they were and that sort of thing. So if we say that they're Caspar and Melchior and Balthazar, that's just kind of, that's just kind of a story. We, we're not 100% sure if it's true. But either way, I thought it was pretty interesting. And actually, too, you know, the Bible does not say that these three wise men were kings. You know, we've got that song where we say, we three kings of Orient are, you know, uh, we say that they're kings, but we don't actually know if they're kings or not. One of the reasons why people believe that they were kings is because in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it, you know, one of the prophecies about Jesus was that kings would bow down to him. And so they took that to mean those wise men, that they must have been kings out in the East. Personally, I, I don't really know if they were kings or not. I, I don't really think they were. I think that they were wise men, like the Bible says. They were wise men. And I think that the kings that bowed down to Jesus is all the kings, not just these guys who came over and gave gifts. And so if you don't know the story of the wise men, here's, here's what the Bible says. Here's, here's what the Bible says, how it went down. So Jesus was born, okay, and he was born in a manger. He was born in a barn. And then all these shepherds, they came and they saw Jesus right then. But the, the wise men came after the shepherds, like maybe even two years after the shepherds. Because actually the Bible says that there were wise men who came from the east and they came to the house where Jesus was. It doesn't say stable. It doesn't say barn. It says house. So they were living in a house in Bethlehem by this time. And so these wise men, they came to Jerusalem and they came to the king who was at that time, his name was King Herod. And they said, hey, we saw this star in the sky and we know that it means that the king of the Jews has been born and we've come to pay tribute to him. And King Herod did not like this. He wanted to be king. He didn't want anybody else to be king. And maybe he wanted his son to be king after him. Nobody else was going to be king except Herod and his family. So what he did was he tried to trick the wise men, which I think was kind of a dumb idea because they're called wise men. And so what he did, he said, oh, uh, that's awesome. So uh, go, go find this king. And when you find him, uh, tell me where he is so that I can go worship him. But actually what he meant was, yeah, go find him so that I can kill him. And so the wise men, they went and they followed the star and they found the house where Jesus was and they were so excited and they went in and they met Jesus and they met Mary and they, and they gave their gifts to him and they bowed down and worshiped Jesus. And they had a dream that they should not go back to Herod because, well, that was a bad idea. And so what they did was they snuck out of there after they met with Jesus and, and they, they were never heard from again. And so even though Herod could not find the wise men because they snuck away. He had already talked to them before, so he knew when the star appeared. He knew when they said that Jesus was born, you know, right around the time that they said Jesus was born. And so what he said was he told all his guards and all his soldiers to go out and kill all the newborn boys, all the boys under the age of two. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why we think that the wise men might have been even two years after Jesus was born because Herod said every little boy under the age of two needs to be killed, which was really sad. But Jesus and his family, they escaped because God told Joseph, Mary's husband, that, the, that they needed to escape and go to Egypt. You know, sometimes I think that we forget, even around Christmas time when we should really be remembering, I think we forget that God is our king and he sent his son Jesus for us. And just we forget how amazing that is. We forget how powerful God is and how powerful Jesus is and that he is our king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And instead of treating Jesus like a king, we kind of treat him like, you know, just some fictional character that we read about on Sundays. And so my challenge to you guys today, you know, whether you're watching this during Christmas time or, or any other time of year, I hope that you will really in your hearts that you will recognize Jesus as Lord. And you will recognize that when God sent his son Jesus to us, he sent the king. And we should treat him like the king. We should show God the respect that he deserves and honor him with all we do. Merry Christmas, guys. Let us pray uh, the children's prayer. Jesus, be a friend to me. Keep me ever close to thee. Teach me to be pure and true. Show me what I ought to do. Amen. We've come now to a time of offering of a pastoral prayer and uh, Lord's Prayer. And I invite you to uh, take a moment uh, in the middle of, middle of our prayer this morning to offer praises back to God or prayer requests that you have. Uh, I know that our list of prayers are seem to be growing. 
uh, in terms of people that we know that are suffering under the pandemic or something else, uh, and times are tough for everybody, so please continue to pray for the healing of our world, the healing of our communities, healing of our churches, healing of, of everyone. And let me offer this uh, Lord's, or, sorry, pastoral prayer, and then I'll leave a moment of silence for you to offer your prayer request, blessings up to God, then we'll close with the Lord's prayer. Let's pray. Lord of bright and abiding light, you have shown us in the person of Jesus, your son, a new way to live. You have poured your light into the world and have asked us to live in the light rather than run and hide in the darkness of doubt and despair. You promise to be our light all of our days and ask us to place our trust in you. The journey in this light is risky. It means that we will have to be very serious about our service to you giving you our best and offering hope and light to others. In this new year, we bring to you the names and situations of others from whom light seems to be a stranger, that they may stru they struggle with ill health, economic hardship, broken and damaged relationships, loss of loved ones, and anxiety. We place them in your care. Let your light shine on them, bringing healing and hope. Help us to be bearers of that light in all that we do. And now let us take a moment to offer our praises and prayers back to God. Holy God, we ask all of these things in Christ's name, and as we join together as a family of God by praying the prayer that he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There are two uh, sermon lessons today. The first coming from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And from the Revised Standard Version, it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, O you of Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will govern my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. When they had heard the king, they went their way. And behold, the star for, for which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And from the prophet Isaiah... Chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the, Lord, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall walk by your light, and the kings of, in the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about, and see, they all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far, and your daughters shall be carried in the arms. Then you shall see and be radiant, your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. 
A multitude of camels shall come or shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and, and Ephah and from and all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. These are the words of God for us, the people of God. May all thanks be to God. Well, it is a new year. Uh, 2020 is officially over and 2021 has officially begun. For many of us, if not most, if not all of us, are so thankful that 2020 is now in the rear view mirror. What has been a difficult year in a, just in, a, in an unusual way, a way of a lot of uncertainty, a way of confusion, a way of who's right, who's wrong, a way of tragedy and death, a way of confusion and a way of just, oh, we need some normalcy in our lives. This year, this past year has been one that was so unpredictable in so many ways that it, it literally has affected every single living thing on earth in some form or another. Every human being, every, every animal, every culture, to every land, to every, everything has been affected in 2020. It has been a year of constant change from one minute to the next, one month to the next, one hour to the next, one day to the next. And it's unfortunately seeping into 2021, maybe a little differently. But you know, as tough as this year has been, there has been the one consistency, and that is the word that none of us like to talk about or hear about, and that's change. Change has a, is a word that Got to hear it on the surface, it doesn't sound so bad, right? But when we are creatures of habit as human beings, when we get to a point where we've gone through, okay, this is our daily routine. Let's say you get up at, say, 5.30 in the morning. You have breakfast, get the kids ready for school. They're out the door by 7. And then once you drop the kids off to school, you're headed to work, working from basically 8 to 5. Uh, and then you come home, cook dinner, go through homework with your kids, put them to bed, you may have an hour or two or a couple hours of you know, personal time with your spouse or you know, just some quiet time or, or, you know, or whatever you may need to do. And then you go to bed and guess what? That alarm clock rings, you get up and do it all over again. Now maybe your life is more exciting than just <laughs> that normal routine. But let's just say, for example, you, you're a creature of habit, which most human beings are, and you've got this routine. What happens when somebody messes up that routine? What happens if one of the kids wakes up and they're sick? Or what happens when the snow is falling and you can't get from point A to point B on time? Or there's a snow day at school or a pandemic and guess what? Everything's virtual for months on end. And everything shuts down. Well, that routine has been rocked and been thrown, <laughs> thrown out into the wind and the Lord knows where it's going to land if it's ever going to come back. That's what 2020 has felt like. 2020 has felt like a tornado and a hurricane locked in a, <laughs> like in, a, in a constant battle for control. And it's just chaos all the way around, except this one encompasses the entire globe. And we don't know who's going to win. And we just know that it's chaos out there. It's hard to plan ahead. It's hard to figure out what we're going to do tomorrow. Uh, I've never been that confused in my life to figure out holiday season. I mean, holiday season is usually kind of crazy anyway, but the fact that, like, okay, do we go visit our families? Do we stay home? What should we do? Do we get on a plane, go somewhere? Do we have to quarantine when we get back? What, you know, like, what are the rules? What do we need to do? A lot of uncertainty in 2020. And again, we're in 2021. We're excited for a new year, and we're hopeful that a lot of the chaos of 2020 subsides. So far, it has not. But it will. It'll get there eventually. At some point, all this craziness will be over, and we'll be trying to figure out what, picking up the pieces and figuring out how that puzzle fits and what tomorrow is going to bring. But most of the time, when we get to this point in a, in a year, when New Year has arrived, we have spent the last, if you're, assuming you're involved in the church or been with, with us, say, for the last several weeks, the season of Advent has been a time of preparation and a time of expectation that, some, for some, it ends on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. It's, it's over after that. 
decorations are coming down as soon as they went up and it's like, okay, this is all over. Let's go back to normal. So it's kind of hard to do that in 2020 when we don't really know what normal is. And now we're in 2021 and we're still trying to figure out what normal is. But I would assume most of us, in most years, normal is around the end of, between that time of Christmas and January 1, we kind of look back like, okay, here's where I've struggled in this past year, but I want to fix that going forward in 2021 or the next year. So starting January 1st, we're going to make all these resolutions, these promises to ourselves, to others that this is what we're going to do. This is what we want to have happen. This is what we want to see. And I would venture to say for, (laughs) I'll just put a number, let's say 99% of us, after week one, guess what? Those things that we had hoped for starting on January 1 are no longer at the forefront. Something has come up. Something has thrown a roadblock in our way and we've had to stop. Or, oh, no, gosh, I don't have time for that now. I've got to think of something else. Or, I don't have time for me. I've got to think of other people. Or, oh, it's just a resolution. You know, I didn't write it down. I, wasn't, I didn't sign a contract or anything. I don't, okay, one piece of chocolate's not going to hurt me, you know, or something like that. We're, we begin each new year, many of us, with high expectations. Like, okay, this is going to be the year. And after 2020, I'm thinking most of us probably in the world are like, this is finally going to be the year when we get back to normal. But define normal for me. Can anybody truly define normal? Yeah, you can go look it up in the dictionary. It's probably going to say something like, oh, the, the state of the way things usually are. You know, or something you norm, well, I can't say without knowing, that you typically do. Or something along those lines. Or you could just say, like, I normally do this first thing in the morning. Or basically, this is my routine that I was talking about. But that's, your normal may not be normal for the person sitting next to you. Your normal may not be the same for me or for Pat or for Sheena or anybody, or Matt, anybody or anybody in your life. It may not be the same for everybody. In a year like 2020 where normal, the idea or the definition of normal that we always had or what our lives always looked like, I would venture to say got turned upside down and has yet to come back in its resting place where you'd like it to be. And I'm going to tell you this now, and I know this may hurt for a lot of us, it's not going to probably come back and sit in that very same spot that it once was. We're going to have to carve out a new normal. Maybe a pandemic normal that lasts only through whenever this pandemic gets over. And maybe another normal after that. Or maybe we're thinking way ahead, like, okay, when this is all over, whenever this may be, because I know for many of us, we thought it was going to be over in a couple days or a couple weeks, or some of us thought, oh, it's not even real. But guess what? It's still here. It passed all those deadlines that we had set for it, or we thought was going to happen. It's still here. The pandemic isn't following our guidelines. The pandemic isn't following our level of normalcy. It's doing its own thing. In fact, it's mutating in a lot of ways. It doesn't care about our normal routine. It wants to throw us off. It wants us to you know, be scared, be afraid. It wants us to get sick. It wants us to do all kinds of things. Normal isn't one of them. Because it's normal is not our normal. Because normal can't be defined by just a simple definition because it's different for everybody. Now we're in 2021 and then again we may have made resolutions. It is January 3rd so I figure some of us have broken some of those resolutions already. Some of them maybe just didn't make resolutions this year because we're still just trying to figure out when normal will come back. But we're living in a time when normal is constantly changing. In the days of the Magi, and Jesus, the world was changing. It was changing in a way that it never really changed before. Because a lot of people were expecting things. They were, they were hoping and praying for something new. And it wasn't just the Israelites. It was everybody. If you go to the very ruling power of Christ's day, the Roman Empire had literally just finished fighting a civil war amongst itself. Once Julius Caesar was assassinated, many took claim to the throne. But Julius Caesar had left in his, basically what we call will today, that his nephew, that uh, 
who became, would become Emperor, Emperor Augustus was going to be the one in power. Well, guess what? His best friends and generals didn't like that. So they all went to war with each other. And after all the dust settled, guess what? Emperor Augustus came to power. And with that came the idea that the emperor was a god in human form. The divinity of the emperors began. Where Julius Caesar didn't have that idea, it came once the dynasty was set in stone. So the idea of expecting this new king to arrive was not just an ancient Israelite tradition or prophecy. It was happening in multiple cultures around the globe at that time. But the idea of a promised Messiah, the greatest of kings coming, who the Magi followed the star to arrive to, was a little different than those other narratives that we have. Now whether the star was an actual star in the sky itself, whether it was like what we've seen with the Christmas star over the last couple of weeks, where it was Saturn and Jupiter lining up, almost touching each other in the sky and making this big bright light that's often called the Christmas star. That's a possibility. Whether it was a star that, like the legend actually said, which I found this this week, which I find interesting, it was a star that literally had one lifetime. And the lifetime was it basically brought the wise men and others to Jesus' birth, and when it had finally reached its destination, it fell into a well, and it is still there in Bethlehem. And only those who are worthy can look down and actually see the light of that star. Pretty neat legend. We don't know exactly what the light was that brought them to Jesus. I'd venture to say it was Jesus' light that brought them there. It was God that brought them there by using the star this idea of astronomy or whatever, bringing this great light and resting it upon Jesus that brought these wise men and this, or these magi to the place of Bethlehem. It was a time of change where not just the Israelites were looking for change or the Romans as well, but even those in the east, the magi were looking for change. Now, history tells us they're more, most likely Persians, uh, which if you watched uh, uh, Pat's uh, message uh, in the at last Advent study, Persia is modern-day Iran uh, and that part of the Middle East, the eastern Middle East, really, uh, and a mighty empire uh, you know, in, the, in the old glory days uh, before the Romans, uh, before uh, even the Greeks. Uh, that was a mighty empire that ruled that part uh, of the world. But the Magi were at that time, were somewhat near the height of their power. They weren't necessarily political power, but they were like a priestly power, a prophet-like power, where they studied the stars, which was not, and they studied astrology, which is like now a lot of people look at astrology like, oh, that's just kind of funny stuff. Like, it's interesting, but it's not like anything a lot of people were really interested in. But, you know, everybody was interested in that stuff because you had the stars. You kind of looked at that stuff. You, that stars guided you. You didn't have, like, the GPSs on our phones. They had to use the stars to get from point A to point B and know exactly where they were going. Not everybody had access to a map because the world hadn't been necessarily mapped out like it is today. So the Magi are astronomers, astrologers. They are wise people. They are philosophers. They are priests in their own area. And they are taking a journey, a leap of faith because they too are desiring this change that is coming. They are expecting something miraculous, spectacular to happen. And when the star first appears, or again, whatever that may be, that light first appeared, they knew, okay, this is something different. This isn't something that happens all the time. They would have known this. That's how smart these guys were. They said, this is special. Let's follow it. It does say that in Isaiah 60, that a great light will appear. And it will appear and all kinds of people will follow it to arrive to this spot all the way from the east, which is where the Magi come from. And tradition has it as three. We really don't know that. We just assume it's three because, well, there were three gifts. Could have been 50. Could have been 12 of them, which would have been a nice biblical number that Jesus would have used. And, and of course, obviously in the Old Testament as well, with the tribes of Israel. It could have been 100 of them. It could have been chest of, of gold, chest of all these different things. Tons of frankincense, tons of myrrh. We don't really know, but we just know there's three gifts. Whether it's, again, one or a million, who knows we assume, let's just, for sake of argument, let's assume there's three of them. 
probably servants with and camels and a big caravan of people coming. And they are smart individuals. No, maybe not smart in the sense where they went to an Ivy League, got an Ivy League education. But they're smart in the sense that they understood not only their culture, but they understood other cultures. They studied other cultures. They studied the natural world. They studied everything. They were like Renaissance men of their time that were just experts in everything. Because that's what they did. That was their passion. Where they took a huge risk, a huge leap of faith to accept the change that was coming. They didn't turn and hide because the change was coming and say, oh, I hate it so much. I don't want anything to change. I like my life the way it is now. They simply turned around and went out and met the change out on the field that was coming at them. In fact, they chased that change all the way into Israel, to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, until they actually saw the change in human form itself that was coming to the world in Jesus Christ. Again, change is not an easy thing for most human beings. Now, some people can adapt to change like it's, oh, like an animal adapting to the different, different uh, type of weather patterns and where the area in which it lives. But most people can't really do that. Most people say they might, a lot of people say they like change, but a lot of people really don't like change because it just messes up that routine. Well, <laughs> If we look back at 2020, it was a year of constant change. We are ready for a different kind of change now. We want to get away from that idea of normal where it's just chaos and people dying and people getting sick to let's get past this pandemic and let's meet the change on the other side. But what kind of change are we hoping for over there? Are we hoping for change that literally doesn't change at all and takes us all the way back to where we were prior to the pandemic? Or are we looking for forward to the change that the future is going to bring and the lessons we've learned throughout this past year? Or are we just going to say, okay, that year is over, let's go back to this. Or, again, back to normal. Well, again, normal isn't coming back like we once knew it. So what does normal look like? What is normal? Well, normal has a constant change. Change and normality are two and the same. They're constantly evolving, constantly moving, not staying in place the way we want it to. Sometimes that's good change. Sometimes it's bad change. We just know that we're ready to get past what was back here in 2020, and we need to figure out what we want to grasp and what we want to take with us, or what do we want to accept when we go over here in 2021 and even beyond 2021. I've been reading a lot uh, about what church is going to look like when all of this is over. And just like any other thing, like businesses, uh, education, medical uh, facilities, everyday life at home, what all, what's that all going to look like is it's all going to be different than what we once knew. We're already seeing that happen. We're seeing that play out now. But I'm fascinated by the many books that have been, that have been written about already. What, what is the future of the church going to look like? Well, the future of the church, I have to admit, was kind of, kind of on edge anyway prior to the year 2020 happening. Uh, in the United Methodist denomination, there has been talk for several years now of splitting because of different particular issues that people can't agree on. Other denominations are kind of feeling the impact. The church itself, the global church itself was in a decline that we really couldn't stop the bleeding. We couldn't even put a band-aid over it. We're trying to figure out how to fix, put a band-aid over it so we can fix it long term. We, we're having a tough time doing that. Churches in general were mostly in a decline, reaching new people. Younger generations were just turned off by the church. The idea of the nuns, not nuns like wearing the habit and uh, you know, in the Catholic Church, but nuns, people that are not affiliated with a church whatsoever, that number was higher than even the Catholic Church in terms of new membership last year alone in 2019. I would venture to say that number has just continued to rise. The number of atheists and agnostics, people who just don't believe or, or question beliefs, that number is rising. 
the idea of sitting in a church and praying to God and being around other people, taking communion, witnessing baptisms, that was all kind of going out the window. And how do we bring that back and bring people to the importance of that when they're leaving in droves? I really don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody does. I think it all depends on context and the particular church in which you serve or where you're at. Or also depends on, well, it really has to come down to the people in which are in your area. What are they needing? What are they wanting? One change I saw that in the majority of all churches throughout this last year was the idea of the virtual world wasn't so distant after all. Some churches already had it, were ready for it. But to literally go from being in person and having no virtual equipment, no sound system, nothing of that nature, in worship to all of a sudden now everybody's scrambling to get it. Because that's the only way we can connect with one another. We were fortunate that Sistersville and Friendly that we were able to provide, you know, provide that, which what we're doing right now. But we all knew that was part of the future of the church. It's just now it's like, no, it's here at the forefront. Guess what? It's not going anywhere. It's going to be needed. That's going to have to be part of the plan going forward. So my question is, as we look at the Magi, you notice they don't tell us what happens in that story after they turn and go home by a different road. We don't hear anything else about these men. We don't hear anything else about these people. We, don't, we assume they made it home, but it's probably a tough, treacherous road, especially going in a different direction, which probably wasn't the main way just to avoid Herod and, and, and that, that whole debacle, which will, that's, a, that's a different story for a different day. But we don't get their story after this moment. This was the only time they're here. But I'd like to think that when they got home, they weren't going back to just normal because their lives had been changed the moment they chose to follow that star. Their lives were changed on that journey to get to Jerusalem. Their lives were changed from that interview or that questioning with Herod to the arrival of Bethlehem. And I guarantee you their lives were changed as soon as they laid eyes on Jesus. Their lives were changed as soon as they dropped those gifts off to Jesus. Their lives had to have been changed when they decided to get back on their camels or their horses and head home. Because life wasn't going to be normal anymore, the way that they understood normal. So my challenge to us is, uh, and a phrase that's typically said in around January 1st, is you're, it's, you're turning the page, you're turning over a new leaf, you're starting over, you're starting fresh. Again, New Year's resolution. Why don't we actually do that this year? Except instead of making resolutions that we know we're going to break or it's not going to last that long. I mean, if, you, if you're able to do it, my hat is off to you. I'm proud of you. But if you're not, it's okay. I'm still proud of you. But how about if we turn over a new leaf and accept what God is giving us instead of saying, no, I want things this way. I want normal to look like this. What if we actually got out of the way and let God transform us into what his normal should look like, or what he expected creation to look like. The moment we, Adam and Eve, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God's normal wasn't at the forefront anymore. All of a sudden, we as human beings try to take over, not necessarily in a rebellion, but try to take over what normal was. Well, for the last several thousands, if not millions of years, however long it's been, you know, which camp you're in. How's that going for us so far? Well, normal has changed a lot over the years. But one thing has remained the same outside of change, and that is God. And notice every time God shows up in the Bible, guess what he brings with him? Change. Something is moving. The pieces are moving. They're not staying still like we want them to. There is movement. When Jesus was brought into this world, it wasn't, he wasn't, God wasn't just coming to the world and saying, okay, I'm going to keep the status quo. 
And guess what? I'm not going to do what you want me to do, where I'm going to like pick up the sword, become this mighty warrior, and conquer everything. No, I'm going to be the Messiah that was promised, not the one that you expect me to be. That's why so many Jews were let down, and people of Jesus' day were let down. Because they weren't expecting this priestly Messiah who was literally going to give his own life for everybody for the sins of the world. They weren't expecting that. They were looking for this new King David, this mighty warrior to overthrow Rome and conquer the whole world. Jesus did that without ever having to pick up a sword. Just not in the way that we as human beings expected him to do that. We need to get out of our own way and let God do his work. I have seen transformational power from God even in the midst of this pandemic. Even when our idea of normal, which, for example, in church, normal would be, we might have cameras, we might be able to do some of this, but literally the churches would be filled and there'd be no ropes, there'd be no masks, everybody would be talking, we'd be singing all those hymns that have been played today, and they'll be played later, we'll be passing around the altar. But that's normal in most churches. But maybe God's got a different idea of what normal is going to look like. I would have never guessed in January 3rd of 2020, and end of 2021, that we'd be going from where we were to here we are now. I would never have guessed the pandemic would have lasted this long. I would have bet all the money I have. You know, I can't bet, I'm not a betting man. Oh, no, this will be over in a couple of weeks, especially in the beginning. But as we've gone through it, we're realizing, you know, what we want, what we hope, or what we think we believe, and all this pandemic is going to end. Did anybody truly ask the pandemic, hey, COVID, are you done yet? And I, I'm guessing his answer, or, or he or she, or whatever gender you want to give COVID, said, no, I'm not done yet. Because it's still going on. COVID didn't stop when the weather got warmer. COVID didn't stop when, uh, when it was just... The cities of God, it had gone out to the rural areas. It wasn't just adults, it was with kids. It, was, it kept going well after the election. It kept going into the holidays. And guess what? It's going through 2021. COVID does not flat out care what we think. It doesn't care about our normal and how much it's disrupted our lives. It's doing its thing. What if, what if the best way to beat this pandemic and the best way to beat they are hatred for the word change. Everything that comes with it. What if we simply just turned over a new leaf this year? We just turned over that new leaf. We turned that page and said, okay, God, here's two blank pages. Here's the pen. Why don't you write the story? Why don't you direct me in the narrative that is our lives? Why don't you take care of it? Why don't I just sit back and you show me the way? I would venture to say, even in times like this in the pandemic, things might look a little different than they did in, say, 2020, when we, as human beings, and you saw this in the news, you saw this in people arguing with each other on Facebook, you saw this in, in pretty much everybody you've ever met, the constant battle for control of normal. What if normal is something we've never experienced before? What if God has other plans, other intentions? does what if we got out of the way and let God do his work of transforming our lives giving us that leap of faith to take that chance to follow God wherever God's light went and it doesn't stop when they get to the destination guess what there's another chapter that's just one page there's the other page to fill that is the rest of our life or our lives so my hope and my prayer for us is that as we go through this next year, yeah, sure, there's a lot of uncertainties, but that we leave the old normal behind and allow God to give us a new normal by simply turning the page, turning over the leaf, and taking that leap of faith and, and expecting God transforms because that's what God promises he will do if we believe in him. Jesus was able to do some miraculous, amazing things in three to five years, short years of ministry. He 
He's able to do amazing things at his birth. And just the story before that. Christ was able to do some amazing things from the beginning. But you know, those amazing things happened when people got out of the way and let God do his work through Jesus Christ. So you have a choice. 2021 can be just like any other year. We have all these lofty goals and expectations, things you want to do. Where I would venture to say a big chunk of that's going to flat, fall flat on its face. Because something's going to come up, a roadblock's going to get in your way, or we're going to forget about it. And by the end of it, when we re-examine ourselves at the end of 2021, we're thinking, oh gosh, I don't know what my New Year's resolutions were. And that's not exactly the road I expect to get. But, or we could do this. We could leave that idea behind and simply leave that open book and give it to God. And let God take the wheel. To transform us to write the story of our lives where we can look back at the end of 2021, starting in 2022, and say, you know what? As rough as that year was, or maybe, again, I don't know what the pandemic's going to do, but let's just say it keeps going. But, you know, as rough as that was, you know, that was actually a pretty good year in my life. Probably the best, because you know what? I let God take control. I learned a lot. I grew a lot as a person. I grew a lot with the people I love. I've shown the people I love that I love them. I've even shown people that I don't like or, my, or even strangers in my life that I love them. I showed them the love of God because God has transformed me because I let God do it. I didn't get in the way. I, let, I just handed God the keys. I handed God a blank canvas, some paint brushes, and a lot of paint. And look at this masterpiece he has made. A masterpiece that is our lives. God made a pretty good masterpiece in creation. Something that was supposed to be as beautiful as anything we've ever seen. And you see parts of it as you venture out, maybe out in the woods or out in the wilderness or different or you visit different parts of the world. But maybe we have messed up that painting, the original painting so much that now it's time to literally offer God a new canvas. And say, God, can you fix this or can you give us a whole new creation? A whole new outlook on life, a whole new perspective. And can you allow us to go with the change that you're bringing and allow us to take that leap of faith? So I'm challenging you and all of you, and my, including myself in 2021, to simply turn over that new leaf and let Jesus take the wheel. For our, uh, we're at a time of offering our gifts back to God, and I'm going to challenge us as we begin a new year in the life of the church, as we begin a new calendar year, January 3rd here, our first Sunday of the month, uh, Andy Piffy, that we give back to God, like the, and, and with power and strength and courage like the wise men. We didn't know who Jesus was, like in terms of, they didn't know what they were expecting to find. I mean, they had an idea but maybe their idea was completely off base, and when they arrived, they were just shocked by what they found in Bethlehem. But they were still paying homage to him by giving him gifts. By giving your gifts to the church at Friendly or Sistersville, we're going to in turn give that gift back out into the community, into the ministries of this church, into the missions of this church to help people that need it most and to offer praise and thanksgiving to the newborn king. Jesus Christ. So I encourage you, I hope and pray that you'll continue to support both churches. If you'd like to support Friendly United Methodist Church, please mail in any donations to P.O. Box 73, Friendly, West Virginia, 26146. If you'd like to give to Sistersville, you can give electronically on our website, our church app, uh, or, uh, and, or you can also give uh, by mail as well at P.O. Box 185, Sistersville, West Virginia, 26175. Uh, you can drop off uh, a, a tithe or anything here at the church uh, as well. Uh, and, and if you'd like to give and not sure where to give or if you want to give to a specific mission or ministry and not sure where that is, call us, let us know. We'll try to help you talk you through it, let you know a little more about the church. You can check out information on Facebook or our websites just to have more information. 
uh, and you can give to anything that you'd like to give. And all that will go back out to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. So we appreciate uh, your gifts. And I want to uh, ask us to, to listen to this video uh, from Reawaken Hymns, Do You Hear What I Hear, which is a Christmas time classic that's played on the radio in many different uh, versions. And I want you to hear the words of that song and think about and pray about giving back to God today. So the night went to the little lamb. Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lamb. What I see A star, a star Dancing in the night With a tail as big as a kite With a tail as big as a kite Say the little lamb to the shepherd boy I hear ringing through the sky, shepherd boy. Do you hear what I hear? A song, a song, high above the trees with a voice as big as the sea. With a voice as big as the sea. Shepherd boy to the mighty king Do you know what I know? In your palace warm mighty king Do you know what I know? A child, a child Shivers in the cold Let us bring him silver and gold let us bring him silver and gold. Said the king to the people everywhere, listen to what I say. Pray for peace, people everywhere. Listen to what I say The child, the child Sleeping in the night He will bring us goodness and light He will bring us goodness and light Let us pray over the gifts that we have received. God of light and promise, we bring our gifts to further your work in a dark world. May they bring your light to those overwhelmed by darkness, pain, and loneliness. Accept these gifts of money, of time, indeed the gift of, every, of our very selves. Let them shine for all to see and be brought into the sphere of your love and righteousness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn uh, this morning is Go Tell It on a Mountain. Uh, okay, anytime. <laughs>
thank everybody for joining us for our worship experience uh, this morning. We do invite you and encourage you to continue to support both churches, but also to continue to share uh, this worship service on any social media platform that you have or any chance that you can share it so that others may come to worship with us, but also may come to know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And will you receive this benediction? Go out as one body, Christ's body, love, forgive, show mercy, Make peace and tell good news of Christ, the world's light. Go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ready whenever.